Hello, everybody. My name is Nate Swick. You may remember me from previous Virtual Bird Clubs. I am here, happy to welcome you to another meeting meeting of the ABA's Virtual Bird Club here online or wherever you are. Um, before we get going, I do want to make a quick note of the fact that uh, the ABA is currently running our spring appeal. And if you enjoy this sort of program, this is where I do my PBS voice. If you enjoy this sort of program, please make sure, uh, please help us out by making a donation to the American Birding Association or joining the ABA. We certainly appreciate that. I hope your Wednesday night is going really well. It is sort of unseasonably cool in my part of the continent. Um, which is a little weird, but I do hope you all are staying safe and healthy wherever you are as we head into the summer months. And uh, man, it's Facebook really not doesn't look like it's running very well. It hasn't come. Usually the lag has come through, but everything else is working. So we're just going to head and go. Um, you can tell that I'm sort of vamping while we wait for people to arrive here in our virtual meeting space. Um, I'm excited to welcome to the Virtual Bird Club tonight, uh, Juita Martinez. She is a doctoral student at the University of Louisiana Lafayette. She's studying brown pelicans on the Louisiana Barrier Islands. She's going to speak tonight about her research and the, uh, the joys, I think I can say joys, of working in a seabird colony. It's certainly a unique place. <laughs> um, welcome, Juita. Clap, clap, clap. This is the virtual clap. Wow. Hello, how are you? <laughs> Good. How are you? Thank you for having me. Oh, it's great. Great to have you here. Um, I, you were talking a little bit before, but I wanted to ask, uh, is your research still going on? I know a lot of people's research has sort of been on hold because of COVID, but I hope to hear that you're, you're still able to get out and see the pelicans or at least study the pelicans uh, during this weird time. Yeah. So in February, I put out a bunch of camera traps. I started my season as it normally goes. And um, about three weeks later, we get the notice that everything is shut down. And oh, I, no. just, <laughs> I was just able to start up again about three weeks ago. Mm -hmm. um, so there's just a chunk of data missing. Hopefully the model can handle that. We'll figure oh, yeah. it out. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I think that's going to be a thing that a lot of people are going to have to deal with for 2020. Everyone's research has a big hunk of like four or five months completely taken out of it. Uh, right in the peak point for bird studies, too, for the most part. Like that's breeding season. They're doing all their things. So, yeah. well, I'm glad to hear that they're doing that. Everything is uh, is going to hopefully, fingers crossed, work out all right, because I know that that story of the brown pelicans is a, a super, super great story. And I'm um, you know, it's a, it's a wonderful thing to see people still doing stuff down there. So um, I am going to, vamping aside, we're still having a little trouble with Facebook. Um, if people are not, well, if people can't see me on Facebook, they can't see me here. But we are working fine on YouTube and Twitter. So we're just going to go ahead and, and power through. And once you get started, I'm going to try and do some troubleshooting. But um, Juita, I am going to throw it over to you if you want to put your screen on um, share screen. And we will... Uh, get going with your talk and I will, uh, I will give it to you. Cool. Okay. I'm going to, all right. One second. Yeah. Let me, um, are we good? Can everyone see my screen? <laughs> it looks like it's going through. Yeah, we're looking good. So, um, I'm going to turn my mic off and leave it to you. Juita, clap, 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 clap. Way to go. Cool. Awesome. Well, hi, everybody. I am so happy that you all are here. And today I am going to share a story about how brown pelicans have really persevered, especially, especially in coastal Louisiana. And so I'm going to begin with a little bit of a Louisiana background. The story starts off here. And um, prior to moving here, I'd only really heard of New Orleans and Mardi Gras and I had this sense of it's just all swampland like swamps and gators um, but really Louisiana is just full of hidden gems and one of those gems is my study species the brown pelican. Um, I didn't really know what I was gonna get myself into. I'm from California and the habitat out there is slightly different than we have out here in the Gulf of Mexico. And the brown pelican symbolizes a lot in Louisiana. It's a huge symbol for the state as the state bird. It also plays a really 
um, large role in the culture down here from being on logos to our major basketball team and as well as different um, companies, restaurants, wineries, they use the brown pelican as a symbol because the brown pelican gives us hope. Um, it shows us how resilient we could be as a state and especially as a state that is losing so much land. Um, we have already lost about um, the land the size about um, Delaware, the state of Delaware. And I really wanna show everybody um, that coastal areas, um, especially in Louisiana, are highly valued due to their like diverse and resource rich habitats. And as a result, we have a ton of people moving in and utilizing the coastline, which then increases the presence of infrastructure. And infrastructure um, on the Louisiana coastline looks a little bit different as you all can see. I'm not sure if you can see my mouse here, but um, I am pointing at these stilts. So these houses are 10, 15, 20 feet off the ground. And when I first saw them, I was like, whoa, these houses are so tall, what's going on? Like I've never seen something like this before. Um, clearly my PI did not mention it beforehand. <laughs> there was no warning that this is what the coast looks like here. But these houses are here for a very good reason. And they're this tall because any kind of high tide, um, tropical storm hurricane is going to flood these houses. So they have to be built higher up on stilts. Um, this is Grand Isle, Louisiana, and it's about 10 minutes from my field site. And um, these houses are still here um, throughout all the hurricanes that have come through. And so this state really is resilient. So like I said earlier, um, our coastline is extremely resource risk, um, rich and with such a productive coastline, it almost reminds me of the hustle and bustle of Los Angeles, my hometown. Um, every time we head out into the field, we always run into shrimp boats and we pass by these oil platforms, which are surprisingly loud. They make this beeping noise constantly. And it surprises me how the brown pelicans just live next to these oil platforms and they're perfectly fine. Um, something that I would like to mention is with all of this hustle and bustle, there is this frequent input of man-made products, disturbance, and even the way that we capture um, these resources, such as shrimp, fish, oil, that have turned this coastline into a very vulnerable state, just simply due to the fact of the environmental pressures of tropical storms. But now we're adding this pressure of these anthropogenic stressors. Um, and brown pelicans are one of these vulnerable species, as you can probably imagine. I will go through a little bit of their history in a little bit, but somehow they've survived on this coastline for decades. But there was a time where they vanished. They were completely gone. The state bird was no longer in Louisiana. And a really big um, factor in why Louisiana lost all of its brown pelicans was because of DDT. So in the 1940s, DDT was very widespread. Um, it was sprayed on people, houses, lawns, and it eventually made its way into the water. And DDT was widely used because it was the way to get rid of mosquitoes and their larvae at the time. Unfortunately, the DDT was taken up by algae and then passed on to primary consumers. And therefore, it made its way up the food chain. And we have the brown pelicans, um, which eat all of the fish lower on the food chain. We know about the, uh, the bald eagle is usually the species that's talked about when we think of DDT and eggshell thinning. But brown pelicans were also a species that was affected um, all along the coastline um, from the west coast to the east coast. And they were ex ex um, especially susceptible to this because the DDT was shown um, to slow or halt 
the steroid production that was needed to make the eggshells formed. Form. So when they would have high amounts of DDT in their bodies, their eggshells wouldn't form very well. And therefore we lost multiple generations of brown pelican chicks. And just to show everybody a little bit of a timeline, because I feel like this might help it help um, the history part sink in a little bit more. Um, in 1919, there was an estimated um, 50,000 brown pelicans in the state of Louisiana. And by 1938, we only had about 5,000. Although like in between this time, DDT wasn't widely used. There were hurricanes and other things that could have um, impacted the brown pelican. But we see once DDT um, is really prevalent within the country, by 1961, there were zero breeding pairs. There were only um, a few like juveniles hanging around. And by 1963, they were completely extirpated. Um, so um, by 1968, the Brown Pelican restocking program was put into place in Louisiana. It was a joint effort between the Louisiana Department of Wildlife and Fisheries and the Florida Game and Freshwater Fish Commission. So agencies and the public, we really missed our brown pelicans. It's the state bird. How do we have um, the state bird be extinct? So what they thought up was let's bring juvenile pelicans, pelicans that can, you know, stand, can thermoregulate, they can stand on their own and from Florida, which had a pretty healthy population, and bring them over to Louisiana. And from 1968, an average of about 110 juvenile pelicans were brought into Louisiana and they were fed, they were monitored, and it was basically trying to convince these pelicans to stay here. Um, the juvenile pelicans want to come back to the nests, oh, to, sorry, to the islands on which they were born on. So we were trying to simulate that process. And this was a huge success story because by 2001, there were 16,000 nests in Louisiana. And that's a lot coming from zero, <laughs> um, just a few decades earlier. And although they survived the extinction from DDT, they are currently getting hit by another front. And that front is called coastal land loss. Um, Louisiana is losing a lot of land in a very quick amount of time. And some of these causes are due to humans. Some of these causes are environmental. I'm gonna start off with levees. So the Mississippi River has been levied off because of flooding. So we put up these concrete barriers in order to control the water levels um, that come down the Mississippi and out into the Gulf of Mexico. Unfortunately, when we do this, we've altered the hydrology. As we can see um, on this top, on these two photos, that is not, those canals are not naturally made. Um, and therefore, we have upset the balance between how much land we're losing and how much land is being deposited. So normally these um, coastal sites would lose land anyways, but now because we've disrupted the hydrology, there's not enough sediment being put in to make up for this land loss. And another thing is dredging, and that's when we create canals. These canals are actually causing rapid um, loss of land because land is being hit by water from multiple sides, as we can see from this bottom photo. Something people may not realize is this, I was gonna say little rodents, it is not little, it's about two feet long and it's called nutria, it's invasive. We find this rodent um, actually out on the barrier islands, which is 30 kilometers offshore. And the reason why they're not great to have around is because they'll eat all the vegetation. And this vegetation is needed to stabilize the land. So when you have a large population of nutria, um, that's not really great for 
um, saving land on the coast. Also, even though I know that they're on the islands that I work on, they scare me every time. They pop out of nowhere and just scurry around your feet. And they're always bigger than what I remember. So some environmental causes. Um, in Louisiana is basically sinking. And another word for sinking is called subsidence. This is a little um, marker by USGS that shows how much the specific land where this marker is has sunk in the last 200 years. It looks to be about like a little under a foot of land has sunk. And just to give you a real life personal story, um, none of the walls in the house that I am renting right now make a 90 degree angle because my house that I'm currently renting um, is sinking um, at different levels depending on the corner of the house. Um, and that's wild to like be a part of and actually experience because I feel like most of the world may not realize that this is happening and it's happening pretty quickly. Um, something else that's threatening the coastline is sea level rise and tropical storms. So because Louisiana is sinking and the sea level is rising, we're having this double whammy effect of losing land, but as well as having land being covered over by water. And then on top of that, we have tropical storms. We actually just had a tropical storm um, a week and a half ago. And tropical storms and hurricane really, really um, impact barrier islands, which pelicans um, need to raise their young. So this is a GIF of the land loss in Louisiana from 1932 until 2016. Um, as we can see, there is quite a bit of land loss. And right now we're in 2014, 2016. I'm gonna let this play again, just so everyone can really see how much blue is popping up. And um, we are definitely in the midst of a land loss crisis. We've lost about 1,900 square miles since the 1930s. So these barrier islands are crucial habitat. And um, this, is, this GIF right here is um, showing what will happen in the next 50 years if we do nothing to preserve our coastal lands. Um, those five arrows actually mark my current study sites. So these are places where pelicans are currently nesting. And in 50 years, they are gone. They're completely gone. We don't have any land there. Um, not only are these places where pelicans are nesting, but these coastlines are filled with people who live there, who have lived there their whole lives. And um, over the last century, about 40% of the barrier island systems have disappeared. So including pelican nesting sites, complete islands are gone underwater. And we're not really sure what these pelicans do when that happens. Okay, a little um, happy news. I'm not trying to make it all doom and gloom today. We have something called Quipra or the Coastal Wetland Planning, Protecting and Restoration Act, which was put into place in the 1990s. And this was followed by the Coastal Protection and Restoration Authority, which was put into place in 2005. Um, and basically their one job is to save the coastline. And the way that they've been doing this is by something called restoration. And restoration is basically trying to get a piece of habitat back to how it was previously. Not all the way till the Pleistocene, but like just to an earlier state where it was healthy and doing great. And billions of dollars have been put into these projects all throughout the coastline, including barrier islands. There's been about 60 miles of barrier islands that have been restored. Um, the big issue here that I would like to make clear is all of this money and all of this effort really goes into the coastline, mostly for human protection and human infrastructure, which is awesome and great. Um, my research really hopes to help inform these restoration managers on how we can not only protect human lives and human um, houses, but also how we can make these restoration projects beneficial for the wildlife that utilize these spaces as well. 
So now I kind of want to explain what the restoration process is like, because if you've ever been out there while they're restoring it, it's wild. So it starts with miles upon miles of pipelines that are strung above shore and under, um, under um, the sea level. So they basically map out a spot where there is excess sediment, where there's enough sediment that they can pump onto the land. And this is kind of what it looks like. It's just a pipeline going across the barrier islands that is just dumping a ton of sediment. The amount of money, energy, and resources needed to complete this is a lot. Um, and it takes months to years to complete um, a restoration project. So once the sediment is all pumped into the land, you have these really, really big machineries that have to be tugboat out 30 kilometers offshore. And I like to think about it as if you're putting frosting on cake. So all of this sediment, it just spewed out. So you have these big cranes actually flattening out the land and making sure that it's evenly distributed as you would frosting on a cake. And just to show you some awesome success stories of the restoration projects that have been going on in Louisiana, we have Queen Bess. So this was our most recently restored barrier island and it was just restored this past fall. And they finished the restoration, I believe in January of 2020. So the image on your left is what I had to walk through for the last two years. And when I say walk, I really mean swim. So I have 10 cameras on this island and they're as evenly distributed as it could possibly get. So as you can see, at some points on this island, I was definitely swimming with my gear. <laughs> um, Versus now, when I went back yesterday, actually, I was just out there yesterday, um, I could walk all along this and it was perfect. And the pelicans were happy. And just to see the stark difference, they have added in what we call breakwaters right here. Um, all those like little segments of rock. Something else that's happening on this island is the whole island is actually covered in rocks. So there's this rock barrier that keeps the sediment in, in the event of any natural disasters. So I wanted to show um, a different island called Raccoon. And this is actually um, the nesting site for the largest brown pelican colony in Louisiana. And something that's really different about Raccoon is we don't see that rock barrier surrounding the whole island. Instead, we see these really, really large breakwaters, which is what that arrow is pointing to. And this just helps decrease any wave action that is going to hit the island. Um, and we see it makes this U shape all across the island so that when the island moves, the sediment is recollected and redistributed. Something else that happens when we restore these islands is the vegetation. So people go out there that are part of these restoration teams and they plant vegetation. And this is so essential because we spent a bunch of money and by we, I mean the agencies, um, there's a bunch of money spent, there's a lot of time spent piling the sediment on. So how do we keep the sediment here for as long as possible? We need those plant roots to sink in and basically st stabilize the island. And those plants are very essential to brown pelicans being able to not only build their nests, but also elevate their nests. So if flooding does happen, their nests are not destroyed. Okay, I know this looks a little wild, but I just wanted to show you a really quick bar graph of the brown pelican population from 1971 up until 2010. So the arrow is pointing to 2005, which Louisiana experienced Hurricane Katrina. And right after that, we see this stark decline in the population. Um, and then followed by Hurricane Katrina, we have oil spills as well as two other major hurricanes. So currently the breeding population is unstable. It's going up and going down and going up and going down. It's not crashing, which is always a good sign. But a huge part of my dissertation work is I want to know what the chicks are doing. Like, what 
are their fates? Are they making it out? Um, are they making it off the islands? Because they are the ones that are adding into the population and then um, creating their own chicks and continuously um, increasing the population size. So despite their ecological and cultural importance, they're kind of um, not well studied out here. Oh, sorry. Okay. So this is just a photo of a nest last year that I was following and this nest just kept flooding. It might be a little hard to see, but the, the eggs are actually underwater. And this is one of those really, really big factors in what we see take out brown pelican chicks. It's usually flooding. We don't see a lot of predation because these islands are so far offshore. Mammalian predators can't always make it out there. And something else that we see um, that happens pretty often is um, fishing line. Um, these are probably the two biggest things that I see out there that cause mortality in the brown pelican colonies. Okay, so I wanted to show this photo really fast. Everything in the red is what is projected to be lost in the next 50 years if we do nothing. And the triangles are my restored sites. So they've had some human intervention to help stabilize the land. And the squares are unrestored sites. And just to show you, it's pretty far apart between the triangles and the squares. It's about two hours on a boat. So one of my projects is band reciting. So what um, my past lab mates have done, and what I'm currently doing is putting leg bands, um, alphanumeric ones on brown pelicans, as well as federal metal bands on them. And this helps us because we can spot them from a scope and not have to be extremely invasive. So if they were banded on one island and that island disappears, if we spot the band on another island, we can we know what happened to that pelican because not a lot is known about what happens when they lose the islands that they were originally born on. And so far it seems like they might be leaving the state as a whole, but we are not sure completely on that yet. I'm still working on this. <laughs> so I'm utilizing previously collected data and um, data that I'm collecting now, I also wanna know how often are we spotting these bands? So we know there is at least a thousand bands out there. So what proportion of these pelicans are we spotting with bands? So far it's pretty low. I've only spotted about 35. Um, so that can lead us to a few other hypotheses. Um, and you can see that this pelican has a maroon band on it. Sometimes luck is on our side and the pelicans actually go in front of my camera trap and show me their bands, which makes my life a lot easier. <laughs> um, speaking of camera traps, I'm actually gonna talk about that next. So camera traps are motion censored cameras that I leave out on these islands for two to three weeks. And that is so we are not causing any disturbance we can get a sneak peek into their everyday lives and get to see things that people usually won't be able to see because they're pretty skittish. They don't like us being in their colonies. So it's a win-win. Um, these camera traps actually let us know if the eggs hatched, if the chicks are growing up and actually make it to the point to where they are thermoregulating and walking around. And the um, these cameras, show us how often are the chicks being fed? Are they being predated upon? And if flooding and other um, environmental factors are affecting the nest site. So just to show everyone what a camera trap photo looks like, I have four nests in view and we can see that every nest has two chicks in it. Um, they're pretty good quality photos and we can get data as feeding, this is provisioning. We can tell when the parents are feeding the chicks. Their bills are wide open and you can see the chicks put their heads into the pelican's gular pouch, um, which is pretty cool if you ask me. We can also see things such as species, species, um, 
conflict. So we just write that down as um, a behavioral trait. As you can see, these two are potentially going at it for some reason. <laughs> Probably one got too close to the other one's nest would be my guess. We can also see behaviors such as preening, which is super cool. They're relaxed, the camera is not bothering them. They're super chill. Um, and these two birds are preening. Um, something else that I collect while I'm out there is vegetation. So we run transects on all the different habitat types, which include dune and any marshland, whether it's restored or unrestored. And I'm looking at species richness and measurements such as percent cover. So how much of the land is covered by vegetation? Because as I said earlier, vegetation plays a really, really important role in keeping the sediment where it is. And that's what we want. We want the islands to stick around for as long as possible. Something else I'm really interested in is elevation. So I wanna know how high that sediment is on the island. Um, and so in the combination of vegetation and elevation, this lets us know how well the island is doing, but also do we see more pelicans on islands that have more vegetation and are higher up? That is my hypothesis, is that we should. Um, I'm also comparing restored versus unrestored sites to see if one is better than the other. And that is my field tech, my undergrad grant, setting up an eight foot tall pole because we need cell service to run the Trimble, which is how we get our elevation data. And there's no cell service out there. So we have to stick up this eight foot tall pole to get cell service on these islands. <laughs> um, something else we're doing is putting GPS tags on adult brown pelicans. And we wanna know, are they utilizing restored marshes more than unrestored marshes? Since billions of dollars is being thrown at restoring these marshes, I would think it's pretty important to find out if pelicans and other wildlife out there are utilizing it. And this is my collaborator, Brock Geary. We are weighing an adult brown pelican using a tent bag and a suitcase scale, uh, if you wanted to know how to weigh a brown pelican. And make sure you have a permit to weigh a brown pelican. Leave the brown pelicans alone. <laughs> um, so here's a really good picture of how angry they are with us once we weigh them and put the tags on um, in that yellow square. Um, we let them go, we make sure they're okay. And we, um, oops, sorry. After that, we get all this data. And so what I wanna do is I wanna compare the restored marshes um, with where these pelicans are moving. So in the green, the only thing you need to know about this picture is in the green is all the restored marshlands. And what I wanna look at is how much time are they spending in this marshlands? And on, does it equate to where the fish are found? So all that black in that graph is where their main food source is found, which is pretty close to the marsh. So there is a very large chunk of the marsh that is unrestored compared to a small chunk of the marsh that is restored. So if, 80% of the marsh is unrestored and 20% of the marsh is restored. Um, we expect to see the pelicans um, in the restored marsh about 20% of the time. And this bottom photo is actually the really raw data of last year's adult pelicans. Um, all the colors depict individual birds and you can see that they are actually not using the marsh as much as I thought they would be using and the orange squares are representing the same area. And we don't see any pelicans um, on that bottom photo utilizing that restored marshland. So some preliminary results of my research is that we have found that on restored islands, this is Queen Bess, um, an island I mentioned earlier, um, has higher um, hatching success, which means more chicks are hatching on restored islands, which is awesome news. And we also see that, um, oh, sorry, this is a picture of a chick actually hatching. I have to throw it in here. It's probably my favorite photo that I've ever taken. And um, we also see that on restored islands, we have this increased nest, nest success. So we're seeing more nests um, raising chicks that make it to the point where they can fly away. And we've also found that more chicks are fledging on these restored islands. So they're actually, having their flight feathers, they're walking around, I no longer see them on the cameras. 
I thought this would be fun to add in some field work mishaps because if you follow me on Instagram and Twitter, I usually post all the fun stuff. Um, I didn't realize a 16 pound pelican would be able to land on my camera traps, therefore ruining the angle of my shot. We usually don't have very wide, like a wide area to which the camera can move. And this one figured it out. I have now figured out how to tell them not to do this. <laughs> um, so if you have any ideas, let me know. Okay, this one time, okay, the arrow is pointing to our boat. It's a 22 foot boat. It's pretty far away. We have to kayak to get onto this island. And if there's more than two people, we need a shuttle. I was the shuttle, but I just kept spinning. I was in the middle of the Gulf of Mexico. It was probably like four foot waves and the kayak just kept going in a circle. Fun times. Um, I don't know if this will play. Oh, maybe it will. Okay. The poop cover camera. I could not get this camera off. The poop had cemented my camera shut and I was using my banding pliers. Do not recommend doing that to get all the poop off of the camera. <laughs> so it's not all fun and floofs out there. <laughs> oh, I'll read for that. Okay. Um, something else that happened yesterday, actually. I left the commentary on just so you could hear. Okay, you see in the bag. Yes. Camera traps have been hijacked by these ants. Oh no, it's on me. There's one on me. <laughs> So we weren't sure if they were fire ants and if you've ever been stung by fire ants You really know how bad that hurts and I was I was pretty sure they were fire ants. So I was freaking out just a little bit <laughs> Okay, and the good old engine failure um, We literally were on the boat for 10 minutes and it just died in the water. So Thankfully, Louisiana Wildlife and Fisheries were about five minutes away and I called them and begged for a tow. That's me holding our two boats together so we didn't drift away. And I didn't show my face on purpose because I couldn't laugh about it then, but I could laugh about it now. Um, it's all good and fun. <laughs> Um, something I really wanted to cover really fast was the effects of Tropical Storm Cristobal, which happened just um, a week ago, actually. and this is the eastern part of Louisiana was hardest hit and that included Queen Bess. This spoon bill was actually found on Queen Bess yesterday um, and I just wanted to really reiterate how important these islands are for these nesting seabirds and shorebirds. Um, the entire skimmer and tern colonies were destroyed. There wasn't a single egg, there wasn't a single chick left from this st tropical storm and it wasn't even a hurricane. Um, all these arrows are pointing at eggs. There's all those little white pieces you see are all egg fragments. Um, and that's simply because they make scrapes and they just nest on the beach. So any harsh weather is going to completely ruin this generation. We're hoping they relay and hopefully in two weeks when I go back, there will be chicks running around. Um, a really interesting way to see what happened out there after um, Tropical Storm Cristobal is, I'm about 5'7", and that's me on the right-hand side. The pole is about five feet off the ground. The total length of the pole is six feet. And on the left is actually um, on one of my islands. I went back yesterday and my pole is buried. So about three feet of land was moved in the last two weeks since I was last there. I, the pole is now part of the island because I can't get it out. But thankfully my camera trap was on, so I have a bunch of footage from the storm. Um, but just to show you like the impacts of a storm on these islands. Um, so this is about 10 feet of land movement. All of that darker colored um, stuff was covered with um, shells prior to the storm. And it's about 10 feet of land that was just moved upwards. And, southwards basically. So I wanted to end this just by saying we could all do our part to help these seabirds that most people don't normally see and are just because they breed so far off. This is a nest that is lined with plastic. The parents thought that that would make a good nesting material but clearly the next wind will just blow all of that off the nest. Um, so we can all do our part in making sure our trash ends up 
in the bin and that our fishing lines aren't ending up on these faraway islands so that these pelicans can live their best lives. And with that, I will take any questions that we might have. Clap, 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 clap. <laughs> Thank you, Juita. That was fantastic. Um, I do have a question. What does it smell like on a brown pelican colony? Or in okay. a brown pelican colony? It smells like pelican poop, which doesn't smell great. But the closer you get, depending on how fast you move slash how skittish the chicks are, uh -huh. they sometimes will vomit half-eaten oh, nice. <laughs> So it smells even worse when that happens. <laughs> nice. And in the middle of the summer too, I imagine. Oh uh, yeah. Louisiana summer. Uh, it takes a it takes a special kind of person to want to work in a seabird colony, <laughs> I think. <laughs> I do have some questions. Um, Jenny Duberstein uh, asks a couple: Are uh, Louisiana's brown pelicans migratory? Do they do they come? Do, I mean, is there a certain date that you expect them to come back uh, every year, or do they just kind of? stay in roughly the same area yeah so some of them go all the way to central america and wow. potentially to southern america we actually don't know there's not a lot of yeah. research on that um but some of them stick around on the gulf on the u.s gulf side so texas mm -hmm. um, alabama mississippi and i usually expect them back on the breeding grounds in february late february to march yeah um <laughs> someone says that i took the bait and uh talked to you about barfing pelicans so that must be a thing is that a thing that you frequently talk about <laughs> um i think i mentioned on ologies <laughs> yeah 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 are there are there certain things about those restored islands that make them specifically like really good for brown pelicans are there some restored islands that you know, don't attract the kind of seabirds that some do? And what 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 brings the birds to these, these islands that people have been spending so much money on? Yeah, so there are a bunch of restored islands that brown pelicans do not nest on at all, but turns mm -hmm. and skimmers will. And these islands are huge. They're like double or triple the sizes of the current pelican islands, but they hmm. also have mammalian predators such as yeah. coyotes, raccoons, and like I mentioned earlier, nutria. So mm -hmm. they actually prefer smaller islands that are further away from the coastline. Yeah. Oh, that makes sense. Um, you know, here I live in North Carolina, and uh, we have some bre seabird breeding colonies on our coast as well. And yeah, it's those ones that are kind of out in the middle of the sound, like not close to anything. They seem to be the ones that have the most, you know, pelicans and cormorants and terns and whatnot on them. Yeah, they're pretty smart birds. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Do the pelicans have any other types of uh, birds that nest within the colonies, or are they pretty much just pelicans? Do the pelicans scare everybody off? No. Okay, so it's actually really cool. So if we have like a huge shrub of mangroves, the mm -hmm. pelicans normally take the outer and top parts, but mm -hmm. then inside and underneath all these pelicans, you can imagine the poop that drops down. Yeah. Um, yeah. We usually find spoonbills, um, black crowned night herons. We have tricolored herons. Um and egrets yeah yeah so the the pelicans are they're they're fine with all these other birds hanging around i guess yeah as long as like they don't get too close they're usually yeah. pretty cool <laughs> i think they fight each other more than they fight any that other birds <laughs> yeah i have a question from uh benny wilson on uh on periscope do you have an estimate about how many pelican chicks survive after hatching what is their i guess the mortality rate what how, how many make it I don't have a number right now, but I should in about a year and a half. Oh, there you go. All <laughs> I have right. about 3 million photos and 10 terabytes worth of photos oh my God. to go through. <laughs> you don't have to do that all by yourself. That's what you have. I guess that's what you have undergrad <laughs> research undergrad, assistants for. Finding the undergrad to help me. Yeah. <laughs> um, but um, just the preliminary data basically shows that the restored islands have more oh. nest success. Overall. Well, that's good to hear. Yeah, at least the at least the money is is working out in some ways. Yeah. Um, I have a question from at the wildlife host. Have you witnessed pelican cannibalism? No, <laughs> I didn't. I don't. I don't think. I don't. They are very much like pescatarians. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they like really like their fish. That's really yeah. interesting. They will. They will like chicks will sometimes fight each other if there's yeah. not enough resources. If they don't eat each other, they'll just, yeah. Yeah. 
I. <laughs> All right, there's some questions. A question from uh, Lalita Rodriguez who asks, uh, why do you think the Pelican GPS tracking showed no overlap in the range? And did that surprise you? It did. So this is like the first from our lab to do any GPS tracking. Um, Mm -hmm. That stuff is cool. I love all the GPS tracking that all the ornithologists are coming out with. It's like, it's amazing stuff. I don't know about... (laughs) Super cool because having to catch an adult pelican <laughs> is just, it's something else. Um, yeah. It's, we run, we run really fast. <laughs> In the sand too, I imagine that's difficult. Yeah. <laughs> um, but that only showed one individual oh, from each okay. island. Yeah. So I need to go back and look at the other individuals and maybe, maybe they'll show something different. Yeah. But they, they're, the fish may not, be necessarily in the marshlands Mm -hmm. um they might be further out shore yeah so do you see them i mean the the map that you showed had them in a relatively kind of tight area but do you see them going all up and down the coast like into texas up into alabama and mississippi like they they travel a lot when you put those gps on them yeah okay so the gps's our gps's are (laughs) what i call like poor scientist GPSs because they <laughs> die after about 50 oh, right. days okay. versus other people's GPSs, which can last years. Yeah, right. um, so we can only track them during the breeding season. Mm-hmm. Um, so they actually stay within a fairly tight bubble. They don't overlap with the other pelicans on the other islands, which was really cool to find out. Yeah. They don't like they don't, their breeding grounds. don't. I mean, their feeding grounds don't overlap. Yeah. Which that's is crazy. Recently, partitioning and that's wild yeah yeah (laughs) um but yeah they actually don't go that far during the breeding season yeah huh um how here's a question from nico on facebook how come there was still a uh big population of brown pelicans in florida when there were no more pelicans breeding in louisiana that's a good question i actually don't know huh yeah i need to look into that (laughs) yeah who, who does yeah yeah I'm wondering if like their islands were further like offshore because Could we have be. the Mississippi River that yeah. brings all of the every, it brings everything down. Yeah, we get we get all of it here in Louisiana. Um, <laughs> anything from the north, we're getting it. Um, so that could definitely be it. Yeah. If anyone has any questions for uh, Juita about pelicans uh, restoration in Louisiana, all of it, please let us know in the uh, in the comments here wherever we are. We're in a lot of different places. I'm trying to keep track of all the people that are writing in. Um, here's a suggestion for the ants. Someone, Lolita suggested put a small amount of boric acid in the camera trap. I don't know if that would affect the, the camera at all, but. Yeah, that's interesting. Okay, I like that. Cause fire ants are not fun. No, all. they are not. No, we have them where I live too. They like, I've okay. stepped in them and it's not. not oh yeah, pleasant. like stepping yeah. in them. No. <laughs> yeah. All right, uh, let me see. Uh, let me just run through here again. 10 terabits of data, people are impressed. That's a lot <laughs> of data. So um, so do you, when you're watching this video, so I used to watch, I had a friend who was studying Swainson's warblers and he had like like Nest cameras and he had all these, this was back when they were on like VHS tapes. So he would give me like a box full of VHS tapes to watch in my spare time. He'd pay me like, you know, I don't, I don't know, like not, not a lot, but a little. And um. <laughs> So I would used to watch them on like uh, fast forward. Do you watch those on, um, do you watch them fast? Otherwise it would take, if you're watching them in real time, that would take forever to get through 10 terabytes worth of data. Yeah. So they're actually not videos. They're oh, okay. individual photos. Oh. Yeah. Ooh. So I actually <laughs> record data from each photo. Oh, so my man. Excel spreadsheet is very long. Yeah. That's a lot of data. That's <laughs> yeah, a lot it's of- a lot of data. <laughs> So, so what are, what specifically are you looking for? Like date when the chicks are reach certain milestones, or um, you know, different behaviors, obviously between the the neighboring chicks and other birds around. There's there's got, there's a lot of stuff you got to look at. You got to like dial in on what you re- are really interested in, I suppose. Yeah. So I um and I'm mostly looking at are the eggs hatching, and it's either a yes or a no. Okay. Um, and if they're not what caused them not to hatch. Okay. If they did, we count that as a success. So ooh, they hatched. Yeah. And then after that, we are looking at how many chicks make it. Cause they usually lay three. 
Mm -hmm. but not all three always make it. Yeah. So out of the three, how many hatch? How many um, make it to the point where they have their flight feathers? Um, and then once they have their flight feathers, do we see them just leave? Because they form little teenager groups uh -huh. and they kind of just hang out. At some point they leave the nest and they actually don't come back. Yeah. Um, they just hang out on the island and wait for their parents to come back and feed them because they can thermoregulate um, mm -hmm. on their own. Um, and so once they leave their nest, we call that a success for the nest. So they fledged basically, and right. which is always a good thing to see. So when you, uh, when you graduate, when you finish your PhD, do you plan on continuing to study pelicans? Another question from at the wildlife host. I think it would be super cool to continue to work on seabird colonies, especially pelicans. But I also see myself wanting to encourage the next generation of scientists, especially those in um, underrepresented groups. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm not really sure how I'm going to do that, whether that be become a professor or like work for an organization and like just really foster that love for our planet mm -hmm. and the wildlife that live in it. Yeah, a lot of different ways to go there for sure. So um, where so are these funds that are used to, you know, make these islands whole again? Are those coming from mitigation funds by oil and gas companies for spills and whatnot, or uh, you know, where is this money coming from? A huge, like, massive amount is coming from the Deepwater Horizon. Oil That's what spill I suspected. Yeah. Twenty <laughs> ten, yeah. and it's going to run out in twenty thirty two. I might have to double check that number, but <laughs> it's going to yeah. run out eventually. And then we're not sure what's going to happen Yeah. once the funds run out. Yeah. So um, I know sea level rise is a huge problem in Louisiana. Um, do you see the pelicans? So the pelicans really like to come back to the same islands that they were born at to breed. Do you see them moving northward a little bit as the sea level rises and those northward marshes sort of become more conducive to pelican breeding? Are they yeah, colonizing so new I, islands, I guess? Yeah. Yeah. So as those marshlands degrade, they do become islands, essentially. Mm -hmm. um, there's still that factor of can a mammal get on the island? Yeah, yes, that's the so it's thing. always yeah. going to come back to being a distance thing, mm -hmm. as well as are there other pelicans nesting there? So usually they see a bunch of pelicans nest there. The thought is that they're also going to want to nest there. Um, so when they recolonize an island, um, it's probably, it's like a joint effort. It's like a joint, like there's strength in like their numbers, yeah. especially to defend and like look out for predators. Yeah. Um, so. so what is it like to hold a pelican, an adult pelican? Oh, they're really strong. I imagine. <laughs> I, I am not a weakling, but they are strong and their beaks. Okay, so the chicks' beaks are really soft. They're brand mm -hmm. new. They haven't done anything crazy. They're not fighting each other um, that much. But the adults have serrated beaks. So <laughs> we normally put our index fingers in between the top and the bottom bill so that mm -hmm. we make sure they get adequate airflow. But then my fingers are wrecked by the right. end of the week. Yeah, because they're just, they're cut up and it's it's a little hard. <laughs> Yeah, like, do you, do you wear gloves? I, guess, I imagine you have to. Like, how many pairs of gloves do you go through in a single field season? So, <laughs> I don't know if this is ratchet. But I don't <laughs> know if I'm allowed to use that word. Um, but basically, I we use t-shirt strips to tie okay. our camera strips with because they tighten up with saltwater spray. So yeah, I basically just nasty. use a bunch of t-shirt strips and yeah. wrap them around my finger. <laughs> Oh, right. Because yeah. it's bigger than a glove would be. <laughs> right. And you probably have a never ending supply of old t shirts that you just have yeah. to get, like tear up and get rid of. And gloves, yeah. like those are expensive. Yeah. <laughs> People donate their t shirts to us. It's there you really go. Fun. Yeah. If you want to donate your t shirt, you can find Juita on Instagram. Yeah. <laughs> um, if anyone else has any questions. Oh, whoa, boy. We got I've been paying attention to YouTube. My, my bad. Um, I got a couple here. Um, on there, are there nutria on the remove on the restored islands? This is from Michelle Kleinholz, and can they be removed? Is there are there any so, efforts to remove nutria? Is it worth it? <laughs> um, 
okay. So Raccoon Island is the only island that I that I work on that have Nutria and it's restored. Call it Nutria um, Island. The guesstimate on how many Nutrias on there is a hundred. Uh, <laughs> it would it would be a very huge effort to try to remove them. Yeah. Um, in the state of Louisiana, each tail is worth five dollars. <laughs> so. Yeah. Is that worth it? Yeah. Is that, I, I mean, don't think anyone's going to. Yeah. Right. No, right. No. Right. Um, and on the uh, on the ten terabytes of data, can you use uh, AI or any sort of image analysis software to make that go a little faster for you? I know everyone keeps telling me to do this. <laughs> I just don't know how to program one of those things to like get it to do it for me. Right. Um, Definitely something I should look into. Maybe find someone smarter than I am. <laughs> so, yeah, <laughs> with that who works in tech and not in pelicans. Area. Yeah, <laughs> right. Uh, someone asked, uh, "Have you ever gotten reddish egrets on any of your islands?" Yes. Oh my gosh. Those are cool. Yes, I love those. Birds. They are so cool. Yeah. And somebody at LDWF has put telemetry tags on them. Oh, really? The, oh, that's the, cool. The good versions, not the ones that die. So every time I see <laughs> one, they're banded and they yeah. have tags. So that's really cool. Yeah, they're all over the very islands. I mean, not all in right. like huge numbers, but we see them. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I love them. They they do that crazy little running thing where they look like they're flying all over the place where they chase the fish after the water. They're, they're great. <laughs> yeah. Um, all right. Well, uh, let's see, we're coming up on an hour. So if we don't have any more questions, and I think I hit all the various places where I can find quote, let me check Twitter one more time real quick. All right. So uh, I, I guess I'll, I'll won't take any more of your time, Juita. I just want to thank you so much for joining us. This was really fantastic. Uh, and if you want to check out the, we, we, we had a little bit of trouble on Facebook and we did end up making it work towards the end. So hopefully everyone got there for the, for the questions and answers of the last part of your talk at very, at the at very least. Um, but I, I just want to say congratulations on getting to the end of your PhD. Good luck on this field season. I know it's a difficult one. And, um, if you, can you let us know where they can find your stuff on uh, Twitter or Instagram? Yeah, it's just Juita Martinez, J-U-I-T-A Martinez with a Z, uh, both on Instagram and Twitter. All right. So check that out. Donate your T-shirts to her uh, work with Pelicans. And uh, and uh, I, I'll say goodnight. So thank you. Thank you, Juita, so much. Um, have a great evening. And um, yeah, we'll, we'll see you online, I guess. <laughs> Thanks. All right. Goodnight. Goodnight, everybody. Thanks for watching.